Our first speaker today will be NCQA President Peggy O'Kane. Peggy, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming for this exciting event. Um, I think, you know, this is an exciting topic because accountable care organizations are really a linchpin of the kind of reform that we need in our delivery system if we're going to have high-quality, coordinated, integrated, and affordable health care. Uh, so can we go to the first slide, please? So why does a, a credit, uh, accountable care organization accreditation matter? And I'm going to say ACO from now on. Well, I, I think that um, what we know is that being an accountable care organization is a very complicated uh, uh, set of responsibilities. You're really taking responsibility uh, for a population and for individual patients. And we don't want to have organizations um, mess up the concept for us. Um, I think that we've, we've lived through, some people like me have lived through uh, periods when we've had managed care backlash and so forth. And um, sometimes it's because we had uh, organizations that were not doing the right thing. There are other complex reasons. But if we want to really maximize the chances of success of the ACO concept, we have to make sure that everybody that's a player is capable of being one. Next slide. So what the accreditation standards do is they provide a blueprint um, for both the ACOs and for those who would like to partner with ACOs. Um, and they tell the, the potential payers that are partners, uh, the payers that are potential partners, this is likely to be a good bet. This, is, this ACO has all the capabilities that are needed to be an effective accountable care organization. Next slide. Uh, one of the really clearly most important things about ACOs uh, is that what we want at the end of the day is a situation where all payers are working in a, in a similar arrangement with each ACO. We're currently in a, in a kind of uh, state where individual payers are setting their own standards and making their own arrangements, which if you're down there at the receiving end of this and being an ACO, makes life very complicated and, um, and also creates a lot of waste. So the idea of trying to get people aligned around a common set of standards is really NCQA's uh, reason for being. And um, so trying to get uh, everybody on the same page with really meaningful standards, that's what NCQA does. Next slide. And we're, we're transitioning now. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you, Peggy. This is Tricia Barrett. I'm the Vice President for Product Development, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about how NCQA's accreditation for ACOs works. Um, here you see a set of seven different categories in which we evaluate the capabilities of organizations that come forward. Um, we believe um, ACOs are provider-led groups and uh, we are looking for them to show how um, they manage um, the services and care and uh, risk associated with uh, being an ACO in these seven categories. And I'll just briefly mention uh, what each one does. Um, in the structure and operations, we're looking for the organization to provide an appropriate infrastructure to help um, providers uh, interact with one another and integrate in, in their care um, and align incentive arrangements and the like. Uh, access to needed providers is looking for the entity to provide access to the full range of services um, needed. Um, primary care, patient-centered primary care, is really looking for the ACO to establish a really strong foundation in patient, with patient-centered medical homes, that primary care is being delivered in a way that's consistent with that model. Uh, care management looks for the kinds of resources that patients and practitioners need to do care management activities and to really attest or uh, address the individual needs of the, um, the plan or the organization's participants. Care coordination and transitions is looking to facilitate the information exchange so that providers have access to a full range of information on the patients that they are trying to manage and support. Uh, patient rights and responsibilities, an important aspect, is looking to see that, um, that, 
that those who are enrolled or, or um, aligned with this ACO uh, have appropriate understanding of what their responsibilities and role is in the management of their care as well as what the entity is going to be accountable for has a way for um, uh, uh, individuals to lodge complaints and the like. And then it wouldn't be NCQA if we didn't have an aspect related to performance reporting and quality improvement. We're looking for them to collect data, to understand their performance, and then to uh, manage that performance using the data that they have. Um, and on a related note, we have issued a set of um, HEDIS measures. If you're familiar with us, you know of HEDIS, but it's a healthcare effectiveness data and information set. And we have uh, um, provided a set of um, measure specifications specific for um, ACOs. Uh, we, we sought to align these measures with other entities, other um, programs out there, including uh, CMS's um, shared savings program, wherever possible. But you'll see that the, it covers a broader range of um, populations than perhaps is existing in the Medicare population because, of course, um, our intent is for this program to cut across all payers. On the next slide. So, um, you know, we, today we have with us um, our six early adopters, and uh, you might be wondering what is an early adopter. So um, these are organizations that raised their hand right at the start, um, you know, only having seen the standards briefly and said, yes, we want to um, come forward and be held accountable in the way that you are looking for us to do. Um, and so they, at the beginning of last year, they um, committed to doing so and then to coming through by the end of uh, last year, and at this point we have now uh, done accreditation for all six of them. Um, and so in the process, they will, were willing to stand up up front and say, yes, I'm going to be held accountable for these standards, which is a little different. Most people, um, you know, when they come forward to NCQA, they are um, anonymous. And if things don't work out, <laughs> um, no one knows. Uh, here, these organizations were willing to say, yeah, we're going to do this and we're going to um, we're going to be uh, transparent about having done it. And so the six early adopters, Billings Clinic, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Crystal Run Healthcare, Essentia Health, and Health Partners, and then Kelsey Siebold Clinic. Um, these are our six early adopters. And on the next slide, you're going to see um, the individuals who are joining us today. You can't see their faces as they're talking to us, but you can at least now see, um, uh, actually, you can see their faces, I should say. <laughs> you, won't, you won't actually see them talking to us, but you'll see their faces and know who is um, uh, taking our question. So with that, I am going to um, start with some Q&A uh, and ask our various participants to um, join in with their answers. So the first question that we have for the panel um, is why did your organization seek ACO accreditation and what are you going to do with the accreditation now that you have it? Um, maybe uh, uh, John Smiley from Essentia and Dr. Berthelsen, would you like to, to take that first question? Go ahead with John. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Tricia and Peggy, for your opening comments, and uh, congratulations to the five other early adopters in achieving ACO accreditation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a rigorous test, and your organizations are to be commended. Uh, Essentia Health is a large integrated health system providing comprehensive care over four states, and it's primarily rural, uh, the nature of our service area, and that creates some unique challenges in delivery and access to care. Uh, Essentia chose to pursue accreditation as an accountable care organization uh, with NCQA in order to establish standards across the system of care and create benchmarks for the performance as an ACO. Uh, the NCQA, NCQA ACO standards are clearly targeted at helping organizations embed the goals of the triple aim into the fabric of the organization. Uh, furthermore, we looked at the standards as our blueprint for quality as a means to demonstrate Essentia's competency as an accountable care organization to our patients, our community, and our employer and governmental purchasers. Moving forward, we're going to use the standards and the assessment that we received through NCQA to focus our system improvements to serve our members. And we've also formed a patient advisory council specifically around our accountable care activities. Uh, we find that the accreditation standards do create our blueprint for quality, and they'll guide our journey to reform healthcare as we work to improve the health of the population, improve the quality experience, and uh, reduce the cost of care. Great. Dr. Berthelsen? 
Yes, thank you. Um, we uh, engaged in our accreditation process uh, for a number of reasons. One is that we saw the importance of the uh, ACO movement uh, that's extending across the country, which really was energized with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and in order for the ACO movement to be successful, then uh, those of us that are doing accountable care uh, do need to participate in a process that identifies uh, what an ACO is. Uh, we also noticed that there was quite a bit of market confusion as to what actually an, an accountable care organization um, is. Uh, it was only partially described in the Affordable Care Act as it relates to the Medicare shared savings programs. But really, uh, those of us in, a, in coordinated care systems understand that it's much more broad than that and actually is applicable to uh, all of uh, the delivery of patient care. Uh, so uh, we do see it as a way to sort through the market confusion. Uh, this is similar to the days way before our times on the call, but uh, when it was not clear exactly what a doctor was, and that's why there was licensing standards uh, in, the, in the country established to, uh, to identify who was a physician and, and who was not. So in a similar process, I think if purchasers are looking uh, for accountable care, uh, that looking for accreditation is a is a easy way for them to determine where they're getting uh, true accountable care, uh, uh, the, the complete assembly of capabilities that are necessary to, to do that. Um, also, it, it does confer uh, a competitive advantage in that um, early adopters and those that uh, undoubtedly will follow have uh, have met the standards to uh, certify as a accountable care organization. And so as purchasers are looking uh, for this, uh, they'll be drawn, of course, to the accredited uh, entities first. So uh, we saw that as a necessary step if we were to advance our own uh, accountable care model. And lastly, as I would say that uh, it was important for us to internally validate uh, all the activities that we had done uh, that led up to accreditation uh, to really confirm for ourselves that uh, we not only uh, aspire to be an accountable care organization, but we've actually achieved uh, all the standards that are necessary to truly state that we are a fully developed accountable care organization. Great. Thank you for those responses. Um, maybe moving on, uh, what have you learned from going through this process, um, particularly related to aligning your internal processes in order to improve the triple aim? Um, uh, we want to uh, understand also what challenges you face in that process. Um, maybe Dr. Teitelbaum from Crystal Run, could you start? Uh, sure. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be on the call today uh, to have this opportunity to speak about accountable care. Uh, so um, in terms of the, uh, the process, uh, we think it is extraordinarily important to take a multifaceted uh, and uh, comprehensive approach uh, with frequent and consistent messaging concerning the triple aim uh, to our physicians uh, and to our staff. And in talking about the triple aim, uh, better care, uh, better health, uh, and traditionally expressed as lower cost, uh, we uh, tend to really focus on the first two elements, uh, and uh, that is better care and better health. Uh, as far as better cost, uh, I think oftentimes we prefer to talk about uh, that in terms of eliminating waste. Uh, we think that the key messaging that has been successful for us with our uh, physicians and with our staff uh, is really um, standardizing on best practices uh, as a method of uh, improving care and uh, health of populations. And we believe that uh, eliminating waste um, is a natural result and, and lowering cost is a natural result of that focus on standardization around best practices. So um, that, that's really the direction that we've taken. And uh, in order to make that work, uh, we've had to employ uh, robust analytics. Uh, we've had to, over the years, develop our business intelligence capability. Uh, basically, uh, we've been using electronic health records for many years, uh, using data mining to be a and demonstrating uh, to our physicians and to all the participants in the in the program uh, very uh, transparent transparently the results of uh, the processes uh, that we are in fact uh, implementing. We give frequent 
uh, feedback uh, regarding uh, performance, uh, and uh, we speak, uh, again, consistently uh, and continuously about the importance of focusing on best practices, uh, eliminating waste, and being accountable for the care that we provide. You know, if the medical home, which has been a, uh, the patient-centered medical home, which has been an important uh, part of our activities uh, over the past few years, um, we began this process in part uh, as a uh, level three patient-centered medical home uh, accredited by the NCQA several years ago, has helped drive the message uh, and align physicians uh, at the front lines and other staff at the front lines. Um, I think as far as challenges are concerned, uh, I think the greatest challenges uh, in terms of internal alignment uh, are that uh, physicians and other providers and staff, you know, continue to get mixed messages from the outside world, uh, including from, from payers uh, and, frankly, from some um, providers who have not yet embraced accountable care. And uh, by that I mean, um, you know, for many of us, uh, much if not all of our compensation is still um, typical fee-for-service or, uh, as we frequently express it, volume-based. So we're in this process of trans, uh, transitioning aggressively to value uh, when much of the world is still functioning on volume. And um, so every time we standardize around best practices, improve efficiency, and eliminate waste, that potentially results in decreased compensation to uh, providers uh, and others in the healthcare system. Uh, and that's this, that concept of functioning with one foot in each of two canoes uh, is certainly a challenging one. But uh, we believe that uh, remaining on message speaking about best practices, uh, speaking about improved uh, care and health of populations, uh, we've been able to drive the message home uh, through this very uh, consistent and multifaceted approach to uh, everyone within our, within our system. All great points. Thank you. Um, Beth Waterman from Health Partners, do you want to uh, add to that? Sure, I could add a few points. This is Beth Waterman from Health Partners. We're um, a large integrated care and financing system here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We were really happy to be part of this process. Um, and it really gave us the opportunity to better align our processes across our system to support and improve AAA results. We've been focused on the triple aim for a number of years, and it just helped um, reinforce the work that we're already doing and allowed us to better connect the dots uh, for all of our departments and areas to streamline that work and improve performance. Uh, in our care delivery part of our organization, I, I think this process helped us identify gaps that we had that we may have known or may not have known existed in that alignment of care and processes. And then we were able to put some efforts in place to better close those gaps. Um, some of the challenges, I think, just are related to the, the size and complexity of our organization, which always makes that alignment difficult. And it, it is our work every day that we do. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe a real specific challenge for us was uh, even though we've been on electronic medical record for years, we have, you know, what I think are really good care delivery processes in place. Documenting some of that um, is sometimes a challenge. We know that we're doing the work, but when we went through this process and had to find that documentation, it was, it was sometimes a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I'll just stop there. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll go on to the next question. Um, what other ACO initiatives are you planning to pursue? And um, I think importantly, how are you engaging others in your community, such as payers, purchasers, other providers, uh, in those processes? And then um, how does uh, NCQA's accreditation relate to some of those activities and help you to prepare for them? Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Jonathan Crosette and Dr. Hacker from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Care Network. Yes, thank you so much. This is Trudy Hacker, and we appreciate the opportunity to share some of the learnings we've uh, gained over the last few months. Uh, CHOP is the only pediatric uh, provider exclusively in this application process. We have a health system of over 500 inpatient beds, <laughs> 50 sites of both specialty and primary care centers. We have about 900 physicians on staff, and we have been burgeoning with our electronic health record with uh, over a million outpatient visits. So for us, this was really built upon the record of our PA, uh, PCMH, 
model. We have 23 practices that are part of the patient center medical home uh, for the 2008 standards, and we'll be re-upping for the 2011 standards for our practices. This really gave us an opportunity to look at how we communicate, so I want to echo what Beth said, that we w looked at our electronic health record um, uh, as an opportunity to sort of combine our efforts with ACO to be able to provide better value and quality for our patients. We had done a lot in the ambulatory setting with our practices. Uh, we have over 200 general pediatricians that have been on this record for many, many years. And so this gave us an opportunity to meld with our specialty colleagues to look at some of the ability to coordinate across the continuum of care. Our electronic health record went in to inpatient at this last year, and so we were able to capitalize on this to provide better value for our patients over time. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan to give a few more comments. Sure. So our, our ACO initiatives really uh, are going to be focused in the coming year with uh, re re uh, renewing our, our PCMH status across our primary care network. Um, and additionally, we will continue to work on uh, our ACO survey. Uh, we initially did this because we thought it was a good opportunity to do a baseline for ourselves. And if we would actually achieve uh, certification, it would, it would differentiate us in the marketplace uh, by demonstrating a better value that we deliver. Um, but really, our work is going to be looking at where we, um, we may have some gaps and where we can improve those, whether that's just in documentation or actual in, actually in practice. Uh, and uh, we'll keep building from here. So it'll both, most, mostly be an internal process, um, but it will be on, on better building our capabilities. Thank you. Great. Um, maybe uh, John Smiley, do you want to uh, field this question too? Sure. Thanks, Tricia. Um, Accenture has been operating as an accountable care organization since 2010, and as Hal and both uh, and Beth uh, mentioned, there's a lot of work that we're doing around alignment. And uh, we began this act, the alignment actually from the outside in, and now we're working through a lot of the internal alignment. Uh, next year, we'll be working on the physician compensation system to make sure that aligns fully to the ACO strategy. But on the external, we started uh, two years ago or three years ago with our two primary uh, regional carriers in ACO discussions and put together commercial contracts for uh, uh, for our uh, <clears throat> as an ACO. Uh, we decided uh, also to pursue agreements with CMS, and, and we've participated in the shared savings program uh, since last July. Um, another piece of work on the governmental side is with Medicaid, and we've been working this past year with the state of Minnesota on a demonstration program they have called the Healthcare Delivery System Demonstration, and it's for Medicaid, and that would inquire, uh, cover all of our services in the upper half of Minnesota that Essentia provides. Um, another thing that we did related to ACO is, is we formed a unique partnership uh, with health partners, actually, of Minneapolis uh, two years ago between Essentia, with Essentia. And that, um, that ACO partnership began actually focusing on our employee group, where we're obviously fully at risk and we have, you know, about 15 to 20,000 covered lives. Um, and we formed four committees with that, and there's a clinical collaborative where we have a sharing between the organizations about some of the challenges and uh, learnings from each organization in, in providing accountable care. We also have a research collaborative where um, our research, both of our research arms are working with us to study <clears throat> some of the new tools that we're deploying, as well as some of the elements within our uh, patient-centered uh, medical home, as well as, uh, again, some of the tools, uh, the stratification <coughs> tools we've developed in-house. We can now to give that the rigors of research. We also have a group that works on employee health plan and design and went through a major uh, change this year across uh, all of our employees. And then uh, <clears throat> the fourth one is employee and community wellness, and it's focused, it's been employees, but we view that same type of work as helping us with our, our mission on community wellness. So in essence, it's kind of become a collaboratory or a collaboratory <laughs> of learning between our organizations. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Doug Carr, Billings Clinic, maybe you want to take it as well? Thank you. Um, Billings Clinic uh, has been in this arena for some time. Uh, it uh, is a um, integrated delivery system in uh, Montana, uh, which is a uh, very unique and very rural, uh, almost frontier state. 
Um, we've been involved with ACO activities uh, since 2005 as part of the 10 groups, one of the 10 groups uh, with the physician uh, group practice demonstration, which really uh, was the Alpha Medicare ACO and, and, and the work that uh, we did uh, formed the, uh, the provision, the description of provision in the Affordable Care Act that describes Medicare ACOs and really uh, defined it uh, also uh, into the uh, commercial sector. So we did this for five years. Uh, we then um, uh, it were involved with the transition demo, which uh, was just completed uh, for two years, and now we're in uh, Medicare Shared Savings uh, Plan starting in 2013. So uh, it's, uh, we're, we're certainly not new to this, and yet uh, when we, uh, in spite of the fact that we've been involved with this uh, on the Medicare side uh, for a number of years, uh, it really hasn't had an impact uh, in our marketplace. Uh, we are uh, entirely fee-for-service uh, environment here. The managed care uh, tidal wave that never hit Montana in, in the uh, before the, at the end of the century, the last century, and um, so it, it just uh, never uh, never had an impact in the commercial market. We we have one large uh, commercial. Um, Payer, uh, a blues player, and then um, uh, we have a, a number. Of the second largest uh, commercial insurer is actually a collection of associations of small employers uh, that are all self-insured, and uh, they have uh, they work through third-party administrators. So it's it's a very difficult uh, uh, environment to start creating the kind of ACO discussions. Uh, that uh, that go to a higher level of uh, of uh, value based uh, reimbursement. I really like the uh, Dr. Teitelbaum's discussion of fee for services volume based, uh, and I think that that uh, goes uh, well to that. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's important. Uh, the accreditation process uh, was important for us because we thought that this might uh, help us. Um, kind of motivate the commercial market for understanding that there is a, a, a way, a different way to um, uh, reimburse care and to uh, organize around care delivery, and that is more consistent with our uh, model of care. Um, so we we hope to Im, Im, increase our uh, profile uh, within our own market. Uh, uh, with the NCQA accreditation, and I think there was a certain bit of internal um, validation that uh, that Dr. Bertelson had mentioned uh, that uh, we really did need. We we did identify, in spite of the fact of all of this time in uh, in uh, a Medicare ACO, we had significant gaps in care, and a lot of it was around. Uh, the fact that we were doing things uh, well, but we weren't documenting them uh, on an ongoing basis, which is important for uh, recognizing uh, your gaps and uh, improving on on a continuous basis. And uh, I think I, I uh, echo uh, Beth Waterman's uh, observation in her own organization. So we've uh, we've uh, are encouraged by uh, trying to. I'll prod the uh, commercial market to start uh, in uh, the area of value-based purchasing. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hal uh, Teitelbaum, Crystal Run, you want to talk about this as well? Uh, sure. Um, you know, the, the question, uh, you know, is, is uh, phrased as what other ACO initiatives are you planning to pursue? Uh, I, I would actually look at it a bit differently or from a different angle. The way that, the way that I look at things is um, we are you know, all ACO all the time. It's mm -hmm. not, uh, we, we don't look at this as, what, as, in, as the ACO being something that is part of what we do, but rather I think the way that we're looking at it is that we are an accountable care organization. Everything we do is part of the ACO process. 
And, um, you know, we, the, the way that I, I often ex- express it here is that, uh, I think sometimes scaring some of my colleagues, but <laughs> is that uh, we've, we've bitten from the fruit of the uh, tree of knowledge and uh, without, you know, waxing uh, spiritual, um, you know, we've sort of, we're so passionate about value, about the fact that having learned that there are better ways of providing care, that it's not about, again, it's not about less cost, it's about better care first and foremost, and better health. And so everything we do is in that direction. So we're, and again, it's a journey. It's an amazing, it's an incredible journey. It's not easy. Um, It is uh, really turning uh, how medicine has been practiced in this nation for many, many years on its head, but we, we genuinely believe it's the right thing to do. So, you know, we're a participant in the Medicare, Medicare Shared Savings Program. Uh, we think that's an extremely important uh, program, which will hopefully uh, yield fruit for the nation as a whole in terms of improving quality and eliminating waste. We are, uh, we too live in a predominantly fee-for-service world here, but to, to put it simply, we're trying to uh, push commercial payers sometimes uh, and uh, dragging them kicking and screaming, but nonetheless, we're trying to push commercial payers to reward us for outcomes, uh, not for transactions. We want to get compensated for what we accomplish, not simply for what we do. And uh, as we've, we often say, you know, we're not chemotherapy, colonoscopy, or office visit salespeople. Uh, we are in the profession of improving outcomes for our patients. And so, again, increasingly, I'm happy to say, I'm happy to say that increasingly, particularly over the past months, I think partly because of the NCQA accreditation process, in part because of our participation in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, because of these external validations that we are engaged in, uh, and because we've also been able to demonstrate through business, through our uh, data analytics that we are both improving care and eliminating waste, that we are working uh, aggressively with payers uh, to become involved in outcomes-based uh, risk contracting where we are going to be uh, rewarded for uh, outcomes. In addition, we're looking to partner directly and working on currently on uh, partnering with uh, employers uh, through um, uh, agreements uh, involving uh, self-insurance and uh, aggregate stop loss basically to create a shared saving environment um, uh, in the um, in the self-insured market where we will ins- uh, where we will share uh, savings with uh, employers and uh, then to, to with employees while improving quality. And finally, we're very seriously uh, looking into um, starting our own health plan, which we believe is the ultimate in accountability and allows us to uh, share uh, the benefits of improved care, uh, improved health, and lower cost with uh, employers and with those members who contract with us directly. Great. All very exciting work. All ACO all the time. Um, Dr. Berthelsen, you want to uh, take the last stab at this? <clears throat> sure. Um, I, I agree entirely with the uh, comments of, uh, of Dr. Teitelbaum. And in fact, uh, I think uh, all of us can see that the country is undergoing transformation uh, from where we've been over the last number of decades of, of paying for volume to moving to a more of accountable model of care. And it is really uh, uh, uniquely American that we innovate our way out of problems. And um, if you look at what's happened with healthcare reform across the world, is that in many cases they've defaulted into some degree of price controls, either at the premium or the individual service level, uh, whereas the accountable care movement really is trying to um, innovate this problem into uh, something that's much more thoughtful, which is managing the dollars that we spend in a much more uh, careful way so that we get greater benefit for, the, for each dollar. Um, at Kelsey Siebold, we're a 370-doctor uh, multi-specialty group practice in Houston, and we have extended uh, this really far into the marketplace, and we continue to try to press it further. We own and operate a Medicare Advantage plan known as Kelsey Care Advantage, which has uh, 23,000 members today. 
Uh, we also offer a commercial version of this Academy uh, brand of healthcare uh, through Kelsey Care powered by Cigna in collaboration with Cigna. And then we are also doing exactly what Dr. Teitelbaum was uh, referencing is that as we see the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, really take hold in 2014 uh, and it takes in uh, previously uninsured uh, members of, of, uh, of our communities, uh, that will tend to raise the overall cost of the insurance risk pool. And so some employers that are currently fully insured will seek to become self, self-funded. And uh, so we think that we can offer them a perfect opportunity uh, to, uh, to see, seek medical care within Kelsey Siebold uh, that, uh, that is all designed towards raising the value, higher quality, taking out unnecessary cost. The Institute of Medicine has uh, opined that there's about 30% of healthcare dollars in the United States that are spent on care that's minimally beneficial or not beneficial for patients. And uh, we certainly believe that because we found the 30%, and I think other organizations on this call and both listening and presenting uh, will verify that. Uh, so there's tremendous opportunity uh, to bring value to our communities and also, uh, therefore, gather investable dollars to continue uh, a cycle of improvement uh, ourselves. Uh, so the, uh, uh, you know, the prospects for continuation of the accountable care movement is, is great. Uh, it is important that my last uh, observation is that it's important for purchasers of health care, uh, both individual patients but also uh, payers and employers uh, to understand the value of the accountable care movement and, and benefit from that. So they need to seek out in their own communities uh, accountable care organizations that can provide greater value. So if anybody's listening around Billings, Montana, they need to seek out the Billings Clinic so that they can get the benefit of, of what they've achieved. Great. Um, so several of you touched on this already, but I'll, I'll let a a few more of you um, uh, hit on this subject. How do you view the relationship of the ACO model and other delivery system reform activities such as the patient-centered medical home or the medical home neighbor? And uh, I'll, t I'll turn this over to uh, Doug, to Dr. Carr. Well, I, I have to uh, thank Dr. Bertelson for, uh, for that uh, uh, commendation. Thank you very much. Um, you know, patient-centered medical home is, is critical. It's central to the working of an ACO. If you think about it, um, uh, attribution to an ACO is through the uh, primary care attribution methodology generally and then uh, maybe some secondary level attribution. So it's, it's all about it. It's, uh, it is really the leverage point for optimizing care both in terms of quality as well as uh, uh, cost, uh, which is creating value. If you think about it, it's, it's the place where access, relationship, and uh, cognition uh, trumps uh, technology and uh, specialization fragmentation of care. Uh, so it's, it's vital to get this down uh, well. And so, therefore, you know, with NCQA being a leader in terms of PCMH uh, accreditation or recognition, um, they have aligned the ACO accreditation process uh, exactly with the PCMH uh, recognition. Uh, and what we found was uh, we, we had uh, issues related to especially documentation across multiple uh, primary care uh, practices. I think they were all doing that well. It just it, it, we couldn't keep it uniform from uh, location to location. Uh, case management, care transitions, and coordinations. All of these are part of the accreditation process. And um, so that is one area that we are getting traction in our state. We uh, have a, a statewide multi-payer uh, PCMH initiative. And it's opening up conversations uh, to the insurers uh, and providers about how the next step is this is really the core of the ACO. And uh, so I think it's, it, it, it's a, a pathway for ACO development in our area, beginning with PCMH. Great. And Dr. Bertelson? We see that a, a fully developed uh, accountable care organization that's reached accreditation 
as the as the logical full extension of what starts on a continuum with primary care medical home, uh, so that um, we think that all organizations at some point on this continuum uh, will benefit by moving along that with with ultimately achieving the the end goal of of a fully developed accountable care organization. So it's 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 definitely something that uh, that all of us need to strive toward and maintain. Great. Uh, one last question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, what advice would you give to other aspiring ACOs? And I'm going to let each of you um, talk about that, perhaps going in the order that you see on the screen, um, with starting with Doug and then on to Trudy and then on on. Well, I, I think that uh, I would uh, encourage uh, subjecting yourself to the accreditation process through NCQA uh, even as uh, we thought uh, that we had uh, a lot of things down pat, and I think the uh, just um, uh, subjecting ourselves to a, an outside standards and a checklist uh, that um, evaluate, helped us evaluate and, and it made us better. Uh, we found this to be the case whether we're pursuing, uh, you know, accreditation or overall accreditation. Uh, for our organization, uh, magnet status, etc. It just it, it it is a way to um, uh, to actually have an outside look and and uh, to help our internal processes improve. Great, Trudy. Uh, yeah, I would echo what has been said already. That you know the PCMH was the uh, framework that we uh, launched off of, and so that was crucial. I think. Um, the interaction with our specialty care. We have lots of very complex children that we care for here at CHOP, and so beginning that dialogue with our specialists, I think the ACO brought us to that opportunity by applying. We could begin to have a dialogue around care coordination, home care management, um, and really helped us uh, use our electronic health record in ways we hadn't thought of. So I think we were able to do that. I think advice on, on the application process is to give yourself plenty of time and to make sure that you understand the depth of the resources you'll need to do this accreditation process, quite honestly. I think we as a pediatric uh, organization are really looking to make ourselves unique in this market, but also nationally to really embrace this concept so that we have families that are um, getting quaternary care here, but also we have a network of primary care providers that can communicate so that the value to the patient is felt at that local level, you know, an hour away from here in Philadelphia, up to the um, PICU here at CHOP where, you know, children are getting ECMO. So I think that was a, the opportunity for us as an organization was invaluable, and I would ask you to think about that uh, across the continuum and then include your payers in, in that conversation as well. Great. Hal? So uh, obviously, I agree with with uh, virtually with everything that's been said. Uh, in addition, I would focus particularly on um, engagement of of all the parties, uh, patients, staff, providers, uh, in particular. And yeah, again, our approach has been, um, I think, because of our. Uh, passion uh, for uh, accountable care and value-based um, uh, care uh, is uh, one that uh, we, we would advise strongly against a schizophrenic approach uh, to accountable and care. And by that I mean um, that we do live in this, uh, this world where uh, we have the value-volume dichotomy uh, where we are torn in different directions. Yet, we think if you're going to be successful in accountable care, you can't say, let's treat this group of patients for whom we're rewarded on a volume basis, on a transactional basis, one way, and let's treat a group of patients for whom we're uh, rewarded based on uh, clinical outcomes in a different way. We believe that there is only one way uh, and that you have to embrace value uh, from, the, from the first. And we, we just believe that that is essential if you're going to get the buy-in of, of all the parties. Uh, in addition, um, we think that it's very important uh, to develop over time uh, robust infrastructure. Again, as has already been set, discussed, you know, patient-centered medical home uh, is one of those key uh, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, issues. Uh, as uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. John Nasser, says, 
patient-centered medical home is uh, at the very front lines of care coordination, while the accountable care organization deals with care coordination at the organizational level and with population health at the organizational level. And so I think uh, the PCMH is a fundamental building block of accountable care, as has already been suggested. In addition, we need to have robust um, informatics uh, and, uh, and systems to make sure we're improving care. As far as that's concerned, I know that some entities have approached the accountable care model uh, by uh, sort of contracting it out to various vendors across the country, and that's certainly one approach that may be uh, fitting for, uh, for some organizations. I think each organization has to decide, do they develop homegrown capabilities, um, which could be more difficult, but we, we believe that uh, homegrown capabilities developing the infrastructure in-house perhaps leads to a more in-depth understanding and a greater opportunity for success uh, versus uh, can you get up to speed faster with, with uh, buying those capabilities. So I think that's something to consider seriously. And finally, um, the last uh, thing that I think is extraordinarily important is, uh, is uh, deciding who you're going to partner with, who you're going to partner with as a payer, who you're going to partner with uh, in terms of other providers and suppliers. I think it's key that we try to work with like-minded individuals who are really uh, see accountable care and value not simply as uh, you know an interesting thing and a way perhaps to uh, you know get paid differently, but really uh, virtually as a belief system. And uh, we're always looking for partners who really think as we do that this is not uh, only um, a good thing to do for these times but also the right thing to do for our patients and for our nation. Great, thank you. Um, so we can get to some additional questions from the audience. Uh, John, Beth, and, and Dr. Berthelsen, we could you uh, just add to uh, any comments that you've already heard? Yeah, I, I, th I think uh, this is John at, uh, at Essentia, and uh, I agree with Dr. Teitelbaum. We've taken an, an all-in approach also in that we've organized and orchestrated ourselves that all we do is along the lines of accountable care. So our accreditation swept across our entire operation. Our application, when we contract, we're contracting for our entire network. And that's forcing the innovation and the alignment that people are talking about. And it's you can't be in two camps. Um, I think you've got to build from the strengths you have, whether it's in your uh, patient-centered medical home or your integrated electronic record and what you have. and. Um, I, I like the last comment that uh, Dr. Teitelbaum had, too, relative to building yourself, building it yourself. I think by building those tools and focusing on discrete portions of these populations that you can get a lot of internal learning, and you've got a bank on learning as an organization to carry you forward, because no one's written the script for this yet, so we are, we are on the leading edge creating that. But I think that learning and then applying research as we go is things that will really help us to make sure that we are doing this in an evidence-based uh, means. Thank you. This is Beth. I don't know that I have anything real unique to add. I think from a high level, it's like just focus on the triple aim and make sure you're connecting the dots across your organization. And maybe from a more practical perspective, I think a focus on processes and standardization of those processes as well as making sure that um, you're doing the documentation that's needed. Great. This is Spencer Bertelson. Just one additional thing is <clears throat> it's necessary to invest very broadly and deeply in medical leadership. And I, I mean beyond uh, the central uh, you know, leader that each organization will have, but, but very widely in the organization. And that's commonly overlooked uh, by, uh, by physician groups. Great. Thank you all so very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Thomas. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that we've been getting some really great questions in the Q's and A's, and I'm just going to throw a couple of them out. Uh, for those uh, reporters who have written in questions, please, if I don't ask your question, feel free to follow up with the poor Vestal, um, and she can arrange for uh, interviews with our panelists and, and follow-ups. Um, so if I don't get to your question, uh, don't hesitate to follow up with her. Um, there was also a question that came in uh, about whether the slides are going to be available. They are on the PowerPoint um, together with, um, you know, the recording is going to be made available too in case you want to share this with your colleagues. 
So that said, um, I did want to ask uh, one question, and uh, we don't actually have it planned who's going to answer this, so we'll, maybe it'll be a little rough, but hopefully someone will jump in. Mm -hmm. um, but one question I wanted to ask was, um, have you had problems or encountered issues when you explain to the, your patients um, uh, or family members that the care is being provided under an ACO? And if uh, you've had any problems, um, how, how did you resolve that? Anyone? Anyone? At, at Billings Clinic, uh, during our physician group practice demo, we had to um, make, um, you know, have um, signs up uh, and some uh, information about uh, ACOs. Uh, among the fee-for-service Medicare, they, 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 it rarely came up. It was never an issue. I think, um, uh, and part of the problem was that uh, it was, it was a, a presumed attribution uh, in, in the Medicare sector, and it still is the case, um, so that, that you don't force a member to actually declare themselves to be part of, uh, you know, a primary uh, patient-centered medical home or an ACO. Uh, it, it's, it's behind the scenes. Okay, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, we're doing retrospective attributions, so... It isn't something that we make a big deal out of with our patients. It's just the way we're delivering the care. Great. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask another question, which is, um, and, and you can either speak to uh, the country or maybe to your market. Uh, this is a question that came in from Julie Miller of Managed um, Healthcare Executive. In your opinion, what percentage of care delivery today is already under an accountable care type of arrangement and how much is how much is not? Yeah, uh, this is John Smiley at, at Essentia. I'd be glad to tackle that, and I'll tackle it for the the uh, you know uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota. Um, in our practice, which uh, we, we serve about uh, half a million people directly out of a population of about 1.3 million, so we're a, a fairly large player in the in the area. We have about 60 percent of those patients are in uh, one, uh, one of our ACO agreements. So uh, we've got a threshold that uh, a lot of the uh, external contracts are aligned to ACO and we've aligned our capabilities to deliver that. But we're delivering that again for the whole system of care. So it's a, cons you know, it's a consistent product, a consistent service. So that's the magnitude of that. I think um, <clears throat> it all depends in the different in the other areas of, of how they consider what what is an ACO contract. Okay. Anyone else want to tackle this question? Let me move on to one that I'm actually going to ask one of the NCQA staff to answer. Um, how long does it usually take, and how much does it cost to get accredited? And Catherine Lee going to answer this one. Okay. So um, the short answer is we, we allow up to 60 days uh, for accreditation. Um, with our early adopters, it, it probably ranged more in the line of um, 30 to 45 days. It goes through a, um, uh, an analysis process internally, uh, comparing the documentation against our standards as evidence of meeting them and um, also includes a, a comment period from the organizations um, to uh, see uh, if they have any response uh, on that uh, initial um, evaluation. Um, the cost of the program for the um, full initial survey, which is what our um, early adopters went through, is uh, $32,800. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so here's another question for the panel. Um, how have you gotten specialists aligned with the ACO work? Um, the patient-centered uh, medical home is largely for primary care, so how have you gotten others um, interested and aligned? Hi, this is uh, Hal Teitelbaum, and um, I'd be happy to discuss that. Uh, Crystal Run Healthcare is a multi-specialty group medical practice, so we have both specialists and primary care physicians here. And um, uh, again, I think it, it is a process uh, of um, 
educating uh, physicians, uh, and I think um, getting physicians to uh, embrace the concept of value. Uh, I think it does work just as well for specialists. Uh, obviously, specialists are used to getting paid on a transactional basis. It tends to, uh, care tends to be, in general, more episodic, although uh, there are certainly exceptions, uh, such as in my own field of oncology. But um, uh, certainly many specialists deal with patients on a more episodic basis. Yet, I think uh, when, you, when you talk to physicians, regardless of specialty, and you bring them into the tent, uh, which we have done, uh, put them within the ACO tent uh, rather than treat them strictly as vendors or outside contractors, uh, you can uh, get them uh, to understand, as primary care physicians do, uh, the concept of value and that, um, you know, do they really want to get paid at the end of the day uh, simply for doing a procedure or do they want to get paid for the uh, outcomes that they help create for patients? And so it, it is an educational process. It is clearly a process of philosophy and discussion and engagement. Uh, we have actually brought our specialists into the patient-centered medical home concept. We've developed a separate uh, uh, homes for specialists. We are also working uh, on um, through a variety of mechanisms we're using at the PCMH level. Uh, we have uh, educational opportunities, joint educational opportunities for specialists in primary care. We are better. We're educating primary care physicians to to better know when to refer to patients and what studies they might do before they refer to uh, when, before they refer to specialists. Uh, so that the specialist time is most optimally utilized. We're embedding specialists and primary care doctors together uh, and encouraging curbsiding and communication outside of the formal consultation environment. So everything is not about do I get paid for this, but rather am I uh, finding ways to improve care and communication. So we've really engaged them in the process in the same way we've engaged um, the primary care docs and uh, Again, it is it, the, you know, the interesting challenges that we face are um, that uh, the, we have a misaligned system in terms of payment, but we are aggressively working to convert all of our contracts to outcomes-based. I think a related question for us in New York, where physicians most commonly uh, are not directly associated with hospitals, that is, they don't own hospitals, nor are they employed by hospitals in most cases, the uh, related question is, how do you get hospitals to be aligned? Um, I'll leave that question alone for the moment. But um, you know, basically, success in healthcare is often is is generally, among other things, avoiding complications and certainly avoiding complications that require hospitalization. Uh, so that is a challenge for the hospitals in this nation uh, going forward. So um, I do want to give uh, John Smiley a chance to respond to this, and then I'm gonna an we're going to answer one more question and then wrap it up. So, uh, Mr. Smiley. Uh, thank you. Um, at, at Essentia Health, one of the ways, and we're multi-specialty, 65 sites uh, in the states here, what, uh, what we've done to engage the specialists is actually take it to them. And one of the ways we're doing that is with the uh, bundles of care uh, demonstration with CMS where we're working on heart bypass, a major joint replacement, and CHF. And, and the power of this is it brings, it brings into fold the totality of care and is connecting them to the, not only the primary care, but also to um, care that's occurring after they're in our institutions and beyond. And I think by bringing them the data, working with them on clinical pathways and our, our uh, you know, um, our our paths for uh, for the care of these patients, um, uh, they're they're become very engaged. So I think it's not only you know as a process of engaging people about the larger vision and view of accountable care, but bringing it down to practical applications that they can you know roll up their sleeves and, and start working on. And uh, it, it's pretty exciting when you see some seasoned heart surgeons really getting excited about this and seeing how the care of their patients, and over time contributes to the body of work we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great answer. So the last question I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask of uh, uh, Tricia Barrett. Uh, the question is, is NCQA developing an accreditation process similar to a patient-centered medical home for specialty groups, and what will that be called? Well, I'm 
delighted. I didn't even plant this question. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jason Rosenberg. Um, NCQA is actually just about to release a patient-centered specialty practice recognition program, which does bear a lot of resemblance to PCMH, but sort of recognizes the unique uh, role that specialists play in the healthcare uh, system in connecting back up with primary care and uh, helping to uh, engage them in the overall um, sort of navigation that patients need to, to do um, through the healthcare system. And so that is being released in uh, late March. Uh, you'll see more information coming out on it um, very soon. We're actually going to be soliciting for early adopter organizations to uh, practices to sign up for this. Uh, within the next few days. We're going to be sending out a notice about that and then, um, like I said, it, releasing it in um, uh, late March uh, on our usual system. So more to come on that. Um, I want to thank everybody, all of our panelists, everyone that was involved in putting uh, on this session today. Um, I want to mention that available on um, ncqa.org's uh, homepage today, you're going to find uh, more information on each early adopter as well as the PowerPoint slides from today's program. And then within the next 24 hours, um, also on our ncqa.org, you're going to find the audiovisual recording of today's program. So thank you all for participating and for, um, for, for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>